introduce the upcoming pain seminar, seminar in Melbourne. My name is Danny Orchard. I'm a lecturer at the British School of Osteopathy, um, and hopefully these will give us give you the. Hello and welcome to the first in a series of lectures introducing to the basic concepts that underpin um, pain neurophysiology. My name is Danny Orchard. I'm a lecturer at the British School of Osteopathy in London, England. Um, and the first of today's lectures will be on nerve tissue physiology. Um, this should hopefully just be a revision session, um, but may introduce one or two concepts of which you haven't um, heard for a while. So first let's just explore the basic anatomy of the nerve. On the left hand side here we see a macroscopic picture of a nerve. Um, here I've circled the epineurum, which is a dense tough fibrous connective tissue surrounding a whole nerve, which will house lots of mixed motor and sensory um, nerves, as well as a blood supply to this, and a nerve supply. Here you can see the blood supply, which we call a vasonevorum. Um, this is very susceptible to sort of traction and compression, and can lead to sort of mild sensations of, of, sort of tingling and paresthesia um, caused by ischemia to the nerve. And it's probably impl implicated in things such as thoracic outlet syndrome or mild carpal tunnel, okay, rather than actual compression to the nerve axons themselves. Within this we have a perineurium, okay, and this is again just connective tissue surrounding lots of um, motor or sensory nerve bundles which are grouped up into fascicles, and if we look on the right hand side we can see the electron micrograph of such a fascicle. Um, so surrounding these fascicles we have a nerve supply as we said, we also, sorry, a uh, blood supply as we said, we also have a nerve supply which we call the nervi nervorum. Obviously the larger the nerve, the more nerves, the, the more nerves it has. And these nociceptors are very important in detecting sort of mechanical compression and ischemic changes, etc., or chemical inflammation. So, although a nerve is a sort of trans transmitter, a um, conduit of axon fibres, it also has its own blood supply and connective tissue and nerve. If we go smaller still, we get to the endoneurium, which again is connective tissue. This time it's a loose connected tissue with um, a small amount of fluid inside it and this surrounds individual neurons and the surrounding Schwann cells. If we look at the picture on the bottom right hand side, this is a um, normal hist histology slide or light microscope slide of a nerve. And you can see the sort of yellow myelination from the Schwann cells and the Schwann cell nucleus. And I just wanted to circle here a node of Rambia um, because it's a nice picture, it just shows the, the, the gap between two neighbouring Schwann cells, um, which obviously is important when we come to saltatory conduction. Okay, this picture here is very similar, but it's just highlighting an individual neuron. Obviously the cell body is not housed halfway along the nerve, but in the dorsal root ganglia. Um, but it just shows how these, these neurons are actually cells, we mustn't forget that. They have a cell body, a nucleus, a Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, etc. Um, but more specifically, they have dendrites leading towards the neuron cell body and then a long axon taking it away. The um, sensory nerves in our, our, our limbs, for example, most of the sensory nerves we'll be looking at are actually pseudo-unipolar, which means the cell body comes off just one long axon. So the dendrite in the axon is actually sort of a continuous um, structure. Um, on the right you see the micrograph of a uh, electron micrograph of the Schwann cell and the myelination. Okay, this um, this is a serial selection section of a median nerve. Okay, and it's just showing the somatotopic organisation of the fascicles. So here I've highlighted the uh, motor fibres. These are for the lumbricals and the interossei, um, and you'll see how they are not necessarily in the middle of the nerve, but quite often on the periphery. Okay, that's a little bit of a, a sort of a falsehood that we get told that the motor fibre lies deep within the nerve and the sensory is on the outside, therefore you're more prone to get sensory symptoms rather than motor symptoms. That is not true at all, um, and as you can see they're completely mixed. And here in green I circled the sensory nerves, um, and the different groups A, B and C um, will be the sort of the nerves coming from different parts of the hand. So remember this is the median nerve we're looking at. Um, and so A, for example, may be the first digital space, B the second, C the third, etc. And as we go along the nerve, so the first picture on the left is close to the wrist, the second one is 50 centimetres going proximal towards the elbow, um, we see that they still retain this sort of um, somatotopic grouping. Okay, So if you were to have a lesion of this part of the nerve, you're going to get specific area of skin 
sensory loss and potentially paresthesia. As we go more proximal, so now we're 10 centimeters away from the wrist, you can see that they start to mix. So the uh, the, the areas of the skin are now crossed, um, or nerves from different areas of the, the hand are crossing and inter, intermingling. Okay, and if we look on the right hand picture, some of the fascicles there have uh, small circles which are not completely closed, and that's indicating a mixture of sensory and motor nerves. So the further proximal we go, the more mixing we get of different areas and uh, different sensory and motor nerves. This picture here shows how the different sort of uh, skin representation of the peripheral nerves stays in fascicles close to the wrist, and in, for example, carpal tunnel syndrome, depending which angle or which, which uh, aspect of the nerve is, um, is impinged, um, you'll get different areas of skin which will, which will show sensory loss. So the sort of vast array of clinical findings we get are quite often because of the different fascicle bundles that are being um, sort of impinged or squashed rather than the whole nerve, which is normally the, the way we think of these things. Okay, going back to sort of cells, the Schwann cell is obviously very important in giving the myelination to the um, the large myelated uh, uh, nerve, sensory nerves. Um, and, and hopefully you remember how the Schwann cell envelops the nerve, the nerve axon, and it'll fill itself with with lipid and and rotate several times around the neuron to give it this sort of fat insulating layer which speeds up conductance. conductance. Um, what's not always appreciated is that the unmyelinated fibres are also covered in Schwann cells and in fact the Schwann cells are integral to maintaining the the health of these nerves. In this picture we can see four green axons of, of unmyelinated C fibres all housed within one, one Schwann cell and this we call a Remac bundle. And on the micrograph on the right we can see several uh, several isolated neurons enveloped in a Schwann cell as opposed to the thicker black line of myelination which will be one Schwann cell covering one myelinated axon. Okay, so just remember all cells, all sensory neurons are covered in Schwann cells and um, in fact if you, if you take away these Schwann cells, which you can do in laboratory studies, the neuron quickly degenerates. Right now, just a little bit about basic nerve fibers. Okay, we split these into three types. We have our large myelinated, large diameter A beta fibers. Now, the larger the diameter, the quicker the conductance. And you remember from your cardiovascular or or um, respiratory physiology that a smaller radius creates greater um, uh, what's the word um, impedance to the flow, and therefore a greater diameter will have a, a faster conductance. And similarly, the greater the um, covering of myelination, the greater the insulation, the greater conductance. So the A beta are very much the fast conducting fibers. A delta we can see here are much smaller diameter with a small layer of myelination. And then the C fibers are these small unmyelinated fibers. If we look here at the uh, conductance velocity in meters per second, we'll see that the A beta fibers um, travel at something above 10 meters per second. It can actually go up to 100 meters per second. Whereas the A delta, sort of between 2 and 10 meters per second. Whereas the C fibers are very slow, less than 1.5 and are often 0.5 meters per second. So putting this into perspective, um, if we think of a two meter tall gentleman, um, an A beta fiber will take a split second to go from the toe to the brain, whereas a C fiber could take up to four seconds to travel the entire length of the body. So C fibers are a lot, lot slower than A beta fibers, and A delta fibers are um, somewhere in between. Okay, the A beta fibers are very much concerned with light touch, uh, proprioception, um, what we call innocuous sensations, so non painful sensations, right? Whereas A delta have a, both an innocuous role and also a role in detecting noxious stimulus. Okay, noxious stimulus is a painful stimulus. So our nociceptors, which are our noxious stimulus detectors, um, are C fibers and some A delta fibers, but not generally A beta fibers. Also, if we look at thermosensitivity, we'll see that A beta fibers are not involved in sensing thermal changes, whereas the A delta and C fibers are very much about hot and cold pain. And in fact, A delta fibers are involved in detecting cooling or cool sensation, whereas C fibers are involved in detecting warm sensation. Okay. 
Now, if we just look at the uh, the skin for a second, we'll see that as well as the nociceptors, we have um, cell organelles that surround the, the large myelinated A beta fibers. On the left hand side here, we have Meissner's corpuscles and Pacinian, Pacinian corpuscles. Um, these are sort of large fluid filled sacs that are very much about detecting rapidly adapting pressure. Okay, so as soon as you touch something, it creates a deformation within these um, corpuscles, and that's detected by the A beta fiber and will then be sent towards the central nervous system. So they detect the initial onset of touch and the uh, removal of that pressure, but in between they stay silent. We also have these Ruffini organs and these Merkel discs, um, and these are the opposite. They're very much about slowly adapting pressure. So they fire continuously throughout um, a tactile processing situation, um, and they give us, I guess you could say, the sort of quality of touch. Okay, so the corpuscles are very much about the initial pressure, whereas the Ruffini and Merkel's discs are more about the, the quality and the continuous um, touch. Okay, so these are cell organelles that envelop the A beta fibers. Okay, now nociceptors are free nerve endings, um, as we'll see later, which means that they have um, a sort of um, a Schwann cell covering and an endoneurium, but at the very end they can, are completely exposed and it's just the, the bare neuron and on that we find tiny tiny little molecular receptors. Okay, So they have receptors but they're at the molecular level and these are sort of protein configurations that quickly, quickly adapt and open up um, in the presence of, for example, heat, um, acid, um, various chemicals such as prostaglandins and ATP. Okay, so the molecular receptors will detect these um, small ions and molecules or changes and will kick off uh, an action potential. Um, but it's very much different to the, to the larger cell organelles that envelop an A beta fiber when we're talking about the receptors of touch. Okay, so remember free nerve endings have molecular receptors at the molecular level, whereas um, the, the A beta fibers with touch, involved in touch, have larger cell organelles. Right, so if we go from the skin towards the um, uh, central nervous system, we'll come along to the dorsal root ganglion. Now this is where the nerve cell bodies of all the sensory neurons are housed. Okay, so the, the, nerve, the nerves themselves, the peripheral nerves, are just axons, and they will have mixed motor and sensory nerves. But when we get to the dorsal root ganglion, we have the cell bodies only of the sensory nerves. Remember, the cell bodies of the motor nerves are housed in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So the dorsal root ganglion um, lies just within the intervertebral foramen. Okay, so it's quite well protected. Um, of interest, I think, is the, the fact that dorsal roots and the ventral roots, which you can see on the left-hand side here, um, are, are not particularly pain sensitive. So it's quite easy to get a disc prolapse leading to painless sensory loss or a painless uh, motor loss, for example, a foot drop, a silent foot drop. Whereas the Spinal nerves themselves, the mixed nerves, are very pain sensitive, and the dorsal root ganglions in particular are highly pain sensitive. Um, so, if you get a prolapse disc that's actually hitting a dorsal root ganglion, it's supposed to be one of the most exquisite pains you can get. Exquisite probably sounds a little bit too nice for, for such a, a pain, but hopefully, you know what I mean. Okay, so the dorsal root ganglion houses the cell bodies, but the cell axons continue on towards the dorsal horn, and this is an extremely important. important uh, part in terms of um, nociception and um, especially things like central, sens so central sensitization and inflammation. So the dorsal horn is where the primary cells, the first order neurons or the peripheral afferent fibers synapse. Okay, if we just take a minute to look at the dorsal root ganglion in a bit more detail. Um, you can see on the left here that we have a pie chart with myelination, peptidergic and non-peptidergic. What this is just showing, the myelination is obviously the A beta fibers and some of the L de A delta fibers, or all of the A delta fibers. Um, and this is a stain that picks up um, myelinated fibers only. Okay, and then the peptidergic, that implies, uh, we're talking about here about neuropeptides, okay, and a lot of nociceptors produce neuropeptides such as substance P or CGRP, which is calcitonin gene related peptide. Related peptide. Um, and these neuropeptides, again, are very important in. Um, inflammation and the acute um, sort of the, continuing this, this this positive loop of inflammation 
until the pain dies down. So we'll look at that later, but just remember that peptidergic cells, cells express and use neuropeptides as neurotransmitters, so very important inflammation. Um, as well as this, we get C fibers, which are a non peptidergic, so the light blue part here are, are non myelinated, so therefore C fibers that do not express peptides, neuropeptides, um, and these have a, a more complicated role that we're not entirely sure about, but seem to be highly involved in neurogenic, uh, sorry, neuropathic pains. Okay, so we have a large proportion, about a third of the nerves are myelinated, about a third are expressed neuropeptides, and the, the small small slice that's myelinated and neuropeptide is the A delta fibers, and then the, the light blue are C fibers, which do not express peptides. Okay, so when we talk about peptidergic and neuropeptides later on, hopefully you remember a little bit about this. And the little picture on the right-hand side merely tells us, um, shows us quite nicely how the, the, the A beta fibers, the innocuous sensory neurons, have large, large cell bodies, which are um, coloured in red here, whereas the um, nociceptive fibres, the A delta and the C fibres, which are um, in red, sorry, in green and blue here, have much smaller cell bodies. So that's one way we can look into dorsal root ganglion and see the percentage of, of the two types of cell, the innocuous versus the noxious. Okay, so continuing on from the dorsal root ganglion, we go into the dorsal horn. Um, the nociceptors, particularly the C fibers, terminate very much on the outer peripheral layers of the dorsal horn. Okay, and the dorsal horn can be split into what we call rex to laminae, and that goes from one to seven um, in terms of the dorsal horn, and then eight, nine, and ten in the ventral horn. Um, but the first outer layers are very much where the C fibers synapse, whereas the the A delta fibers also synapse in the um, outer layer, but the A beta fibers tend to sign up much deeper. Okay, so again, when we look at the types of neurons, this becomes a bit more relevant. Okay, so from the dorsal horn neurons, so from the peripheral neurons, we have synapses that synapse onto three different type types of dorsal horn neurons. Okay, we have projector neurons. These are nociceptor specific, meaning they um, only take nociceptive input and they take it straight up towards the thalamus. And up to the brain. We have interneurons which link a lot of these um, dorsal horn neurons with the peripheral afferent fibers. And then we have these um, very clever group with wide dynamic range neurons. Okay, and they are involved in light touch as well as nociceptive input. Okay, and it seems to be that the stronger the stimulus, the more they code for nociception. So if you have a, a large nociceptive barrage from the periphery, it's going to increase the response rate of these and, and therefore code for a nociceptive or painful sensation higher up. Okay, now these projector neurons are, as we said, they're called nociceptive-specific nociceptive specific neurons and they are um, activated directly via A delta fibers, as we just saw, but indirectly via C fibers. Okay, whereas if we look at the wide dynamic range neurons, we'll see that they're contacted directly by A beta fibers, directly also by the A delta fibers, but again indirectly by the C fibers. So we have a picture whereby we have these specific, nociceptive specific neurons that project directly to the thalamus, only being um, initiated by nociceptors. We have interneurons which are linking the nociceptors with the um, dorsal horn neurons, and then we have these wide dynamic range neurons which are activated by both nociceptive and non-nociceptive, and indirectly from C fibers via these interneurons. Okay, so that's a very simplistic view of what is an extremely complex arrangement of neurons. Okay, and just to remind you that interneurons can be either excitatory or inhibitory. And when we come on later in the second lecture to look at um, dorsal horn and um, sensitization, we'll see that the excitation or the inhibition is very much integral to, to whether or not we perceive pain. So from the dorsal horn we then ascend either in the dorsal column, so this is just light touch, proprioception, proprioception and vibration. So it will ascend in the dorsal columns, um, decussate or cross in the medulla, then continue ascending um, in the second order neuron um, along the medial lemniscus into the thalamus where it will synapse with the third order neuron 
which will then project to the somatosensory cortex, okay, and that will tell us where in our body map the the sensation is is um, occurring. Okay, now that's more about innocuous sensation. The spinothalamic tract is about more fine touch, but also tickle and itch and warm, cold and pain. Okay, so here we have a picture whereby the nociceptors sign up directly onto the dorsal horn. Okay, then the second dorsal neurons decussate within one or two levels of the cord and then cross on the ips, uh, sorry, the contralateral spinal cord up to the thalamus where they sign up with third order neurons which then go towards the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, when we're just talking about sort of pain pathways, um, we can split the um, nociceptive pathways into roughly into two. Okay, we have a medial pathway that goes via the medial part of the thalamus, okay, and onwards towards the limbic system, which we'll mention in a second. Limbic system is very much about emotional aspects of pain, the effective aspect of pain. Okay, and this this uh, pathway is very slow, slow pathway, and it gives us this sort of emotional experience of of what that pain meant to us. Okay, and this is very different to the lateral pathway, which goes via the lateral thalamus and then into the somatosensory cortex. This is very fast and is involved in discrimination. So when you, uh, when you injure yourself, you want to quickly know where it's coming from, potentially to remove that, that limb or body part from the, from the flame or from the, from the, the cut or whatever. Um, and then a, a slightly slower um, impulse will arrive, which goes via the limbic system and tells us what that pain meant to us. Okay, so if, you, if we take children as an example, um, I'm sure we've all seen uh, young young children or babies who haven't really learnt what damage means. So when they cut themselves, they quickly look up to an adult to to sense the meaning that, that pain should have. Um, and if if the parents rush the to the, to the toddler, um, cringing and, and and looking shocked, that baby will quickly learn that um, that's a, a painful and aversive stimulus. Okay, I'm not suggesting for a minute that you just laugh at the time your children hurt themselves, but um, hopefully you understand what, what I'm saying there. Okay, so the discriminative aspect of, of sort of no perception and touch goes into the somatosensory cortex, okay, and this is um, along the sort of parietal lobe, okay, in the, in the sort of sagittal section of the brain, um, and this has a, a sort of topographic map. So here we have a picture of a person draped over the, uh, from the, the medium sulcus of the brain over the angle and then all the way along the, the superior and lateral aspects of the parietal cortex. Okay, this picture here is a, a rather rather pretty um, artist model of what that homunculus man would look like if we uh, if he actually existed. So it's obviously a representation of the sensitive parts of his body. Um, I'll leave the rest to you there. Now this the somatosensory cortex or the homunculus is. Very remarkable. Okay, it's not fixed at all. We think of it as being purely, uh, you know, fixed neurons that did, that um, relate to certain body parts. But actually, it's highly adaptable and plastic. And here we have an example of phantom limb pain. The first picture on the left, we can see the face representation in yellow, and then the representation of the hand in blue. Um, and when that when that person loses their upper limb, you can see how the face sort of enlarges, or the head um, enlarges to take over that, that area of the cortex which is, which is not receiving a signal. Okay, so the lack of signal causes the, uh, the other areas to sort of migrate into it. And then if we look down at the, uh, the third diagram, we see that after a while the sort of neurons start to mingle a little bit and you get a representation of, of both um, the hand and, the, uh, and the, the head mixing up there. And then they separate again, which can leave you. This it doesn't happen to everyone, but in certain people it leaves you with a, a clear representation of the head and face, as it should be, but a mixed picture whereby there is a hand, which is being represented, but being contacted by neurons from the face. And if we look at that clinically, what you get is an amputee, whereby if you stroke his face and jaw, you will actually feel a sensation of light touch or stroking occurring on the phantom limb. Okay, so here we have a picture where the, by the homunculus is very plastic and with the absence of an input, the, the surrounding parts will actually migrate to, um, to take over that representation. This doesn't happen in, in everyone, but um, it is fairly common in amputees. 
Now, this shows it's plastic, but actually it's a lot pl more plastic than we'd, even, than we'd ever imagined. And there's lots of studies showing that um, in Braille readers, uh, for example, who obviously have to have a very fine discriminative, t discriminative touch, um, we'll see that before training they have a certain amount of neurons lighting up in a functional MRI scanner. Um, and after, after training, so before training and then after training, we get much more activity in certain areas. So this is the areas um, relating to the, the digits. Okay, so training can increase the number of neurons representing that body part, um, but it's still the speed which is rather um, fascinating. They can actually show that a braille reader who is going to do a sort of nine to five job reading braille, they scan his, his or her brain 30 minutes before going to work. You actually see an alteration in that somatosensory cortex um, which will stay very heightened throughout their day and then at, nine, at five o'clock when they clock off that somatosensory cortex actually reduces in size back to the sort of pre-work level. So this sort of adaptability and plasticity is not at all fixed and it's actually very, very quick to change. Here I've just circled uh, D1 and D5 which uh, represent digits 1 and 5 and you can see how the the yellow parts are here are before and then the red parts are after so even within the space of a day you can get a, a, a fast alteration in um, representation. The way it does this is very complicated um, we don't necessarily need to go into it but basically what it is is each neuron seems to have a whole body receptive field so every neuron has a sort of body image has its own homun homunculus but the majority of it is inhibited so only that part those that those neurons that are relating to the body part that it should represent are active okay so when you lose a body part or when you're retraining another body part the neurons next to it adjacent will switch their inhibition to actually only represent a new body part or the body part adjacent to it okay i'm not sure if i explained myself at all then so uh, when we meet up, I will explain it in more detail. Okay, so from the from the um, ascending pathways, we go to the somatosensory cortex, and we also go to the limbic system, as I said. And the limbic system is very much about the the emotional and affective aspect to um, an experience. Okay, so here we're also talking about pain, um, and the different parts of the limbic system are, for example, the amygdala, which is very, which is about fear and um, anxiety. Okay, the hippocampus, which is about long-term memory storage and retrieval. Uh, the cingulate cortex, which is also about long-term memory um, retrieval, retrieval, but also sort of motivation and whether or not that um, experience is something that we wish to do again or, or not. This is uh, very important in, in disorders such as depression and schizophrenia, where motivation is obviously a, a big factor. Um, and then I've put it the insulator in here. This the insula is not part of the limbic system anatomically, but it's very much about emotion and, um, and memory and uh, sort of homeostatic connections with the body parts. So they quite often talk about introspection, the, uh, the, the ability to detect what's happening within your own body going via the insula. So all these parts link up to this uh, medial sort of pain pathway. Um, and give us that sort of effective, eff effective or emotional quality to a pain. Okay, not just the localization of 